Okay, so I think we can get started. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to Ask Seminar Series. Um, I'm John, the Seminar Coordinator, and and today I will be uh, the moderator um, of our um, communication specialist, Kathy Metheny Seek. Um, and just so you know, then the seminar is being recorded, um, and um, we will put the recording on the U ASIC YouTube channel. Um, feel free to bring up any questions after the speaker's talk. And um, our today, our associate director, um, Ralph Ferrero, also joined us, and he will be introducing the speaker. And we are very excited to have Dr. Um, Ho here. And let me um, turn this over to Ralph. Ralph, please proceed. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pleased to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Ben Ho, from uh, known as the Star. Ben and I were, were colleagues for... Uh, uh, three years at STAR, and, and he, point, he, re, he reminded me we also, we met about a decade ago. Um, we both were um, PIs on projects at um, uh, the Climatic uh, Data Center down in Asheville. Uh, Ben's gotten, he received his PhD at uh, University of Wisconsin, and um, he's now the, um, the, the GPS RO lead scientist at NESDA STAR, as well as their sounding uh, science team lead, and um, <clears throat> he's got a lot of uh, international recognition in the field. It's a very specialized field, and uh, he um, he also was a co-chair of the GWEX radiation panel, and and I think he did a lot of his original work um, on the cosmic mission, which which was I think one of the first uh, GPS RO missions um, when he was at um, NCAR. And so, um, yeah, I'll turn it over to Ben. I would be interested in hearing his talk about how how this technology is used for um, atmospheric applications and climate monitoring at NOAA. Yeah. Thanks, Rolf, and thanks, John, for the invitation. I think uh, this is a good time that uh, maybe talk about the application of GPS RO because uh, uh, last year is a very exciting for climate, right? Because the IPCC report AR6. Uh, issue and uh, a lot of people working for two years for that report, and then you know out of surprise that uh, the the Nobel Physics Prize actually issued to a uh, atmosphere scientist, which is really relates to the contribution for the global warming. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the, again the using GNSS uh, RO system and uh, for the atmospheric application and the climate monitoring in a uh, NOAA star. And uh, uh, this is my email, and this is my team. So you can go, you know, take a look, log in, and uh, see what you know the activities there. And uh, I actually been, as Ralph mentioned, I've been in uh, NOAA for three years. And uh, so in three years, that NOAA want me to build up a team, so that NOAA uh, can start to really using GPS RO data, the GNSS RO data. For a lot of research, which is just the same as they use for the infrared microwave. So I cannot do this work by myself. So I generate this chart to list the staff who work with me in my team, including the RO data processing and the Dr. Yongchen, Dr. Bing Zhang, Dr. Jin Dong, Lok, Stan, and also Mr. Uh, Xin Jia Zhou, and the Dr. Uh, Xi Sao, also from University of Maryland, and his team working for me for the mod the multi-sensor validation monitoring and a lot of intercomparison and also for climate. And uh, Dr. Will uh, Miller also from uh, University of Maryland also working on the data simulation. So we want to build up a team to understand GPS RO measurement, instrument, application in and out from the very beginning, the raw data to the end and for all the different application. And uh, uh, mainly in this talk, actually is a summarize my paper in 2021 in Bain's paper. Also the recent two papers I, uh, I published recently. And uh, okay, so the outline of my talk is I'm going to talk about why we want to use in GPS RO data and uh, why that when we still have a microwave and infrared data, then how more our data can give us. Going to talk about the characteristic of the GNSS RO data and uh, the uh, uh, processing 
and uh, um, uh, some 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 detail about star RO processing. We're going to talk about the RO application in climate in star and also the atmosphere application in star using GNSS as our data and give the summary and the future plan. And uh, uh, why we, we why we want to use in GNSS as our data is the we have a lot of infrared microwave data. Is that enough? So uh, you know almost 10, 20 something years ago we talking about the global warming. We want to know is that is that valid? Is that true? And then we want to use satellite data to detect that. However, most of the satellite data are not, are not, met, are not designed for climate monitoring. And then when the change of the platform, then you will see this uh, inter-satellite bias, you know, when they are overlapping between, between the, uh, in this case, it's microwave uh, sensors. And then also different people actually process the data because you need to merge the data then different people actually give you a different trend because the merger methods are not the same. So on the uh, upper right, you can see the so-called UAH, um, University of Alabama, Huntsville, process the uh, microwave data and the RSS, uh, the company that process the uh, microwave data that you can see when you compare one to the other, they have obviously difference. Not only that, but also you need to uh, you need to make sure that you, you need to address there's a so-called local time drift. In this case, it's a microwave sensor. And then if you want to use in radio sound, then there's a very, uh, um, a very, very uh, notable um, quality of the radio sound when you change the instrument or the observation practice. And then with only local uh, limited special coverage, by using the radio song. And I will show you later that how different type of radio song actually will give you different, um, different uh, so-called climate trend. So we really need the measurement with a high precision, high accuracy, long-term stability, and the reasonable good temporal and the special coverage for climate bench observation. But not only that, when we're dealing with the climate issue, we, we really need to know a lot of different things, how they re, uh, connect to each other, for example, the the uh, cl cloud, cloud feedback and the water vapor feedback. And basically this is the problem related to what is really under the cloud, within the cloud, outside the cloud, above the cloud, which actually is uh, very difficult for, for satellite remote sensing, especially the native viewing uh, instrument like a, a microwave or infrared, okay? So what, what exactly happened within the cloud or below the cloud is actually is very important that we need a good observation to tell us the result. And uh, uh, just recently, and as uh, Rob mentioned, I have been in uh, NOAA for three years. And the, the reason is uh, NOAA will start to uh, consider using our data as a long-term co-observable to be treated the same as uh, those uh, satellite observation in NOAA, like infrared microwave. And that means we want to understand the in and out of the data and uh, have, can have capability to process the data from very beginning to the end. And uh, you know all the different our mission and have a different receiver, different emitter, and we want to we want to also have the NOAA science development and also try to produce this data and the science can support the user and the community. Okay, and in the past, you know, um, probably I would say close to uh, eighteen years, starting from uh, Cosmet that we have a certain amount of data which is about like a. 2,000 to 3,000 profile per day. And then in different mission, you will add up together. And then now we have a probably including Cosmet 2, and also uh, the sum of the uh, commercial data that we will have uh, maybe 10,000 profile per day. But those 10,000 profile compared with infrared microwave, it's a very small amount. For each uh, infrared mission, we easily we can have half million observation. Uh, how will that help us for the uh, climate application? And the many others, and uh, uh, I will I will talk about that later. And then, the reason is uh, some characteristic of the our data is very unique that can help us. So our data, as uh, as on the right um, uh, right panel, you can see we have a GPS or GNSS satellite at a much higher altitude, and we have Leo satellite. And then we in the Leo satellite we have the uh, the GPS receiver or G the GNSS receiver, so that the atmosphere um, emission 
from the GPS satellite pass the radio signal pass through the atmosphere, then we can detect the bending. And then the bending is mainly due to the atmosphere density itself. So the whole processing is uh, we can we, we need to decoding the receiver's data and uh, have the phase delay and then derive the assets phase delay and then we derive the bending angle reflectivity profile and, the, and then we can have a temperature water vapor and the pressure profile and then by using this the real observation we have actually is a tight differences between if there's a no atmosphere and if there's an atmosphere the differences between these two so the tight differences is actually the raw measurement we have and uh, after the deriving of the parameter, including the bending angle reflectivity and everything, then the characteristic or the uniqueness of our own measurement is, I have the list, maybe I just read it, that um, this link sounding geometry complementary to the ground and the space need a viewing instrument and they have a global coverage and uh, the, um, have the profile, the ion sphere, stratosphere and the troposphere and high accuracy and the accuracy can be as good as less than 0.5 Kelvin and the average accuracy is uh, less than 0.1 Kelvin. You think about that, 0.1 Kelvin, okay? You, you actually, even, even you, you, you using whatever measurement, you using uh, like uh, uh, whatever to, to measure something, it's, it's not, cannot be as good as 0.1 Kelvin. And the precision is uh, like a, from 0.02 to 0.05 Kelvin. And uh, we have a high vertical resolution is around like uh, maybe a few uh, hundred meters to uh, one, one kilometer and not affected by the cloud. And uh, again, it's a complementary to the infrared microwave sounding and they require no first guess sounding. And uh, the result is independent with the radio sound calibration and the no instrument drift. That means no matter when, how you launch the instrument, it should not affect the, your measurement quality theoretically. And I will show you why, how, how in real data look like. And then again, no satellite to satellite buyers and uh, um, compact sensor, low power, low cost, and the less sensitivity to inversion algorithm. And I published several different papers to quantify all this uh, quality. And then we try to make sure theoretical result is really happen in the real, real measurement. And uh, everything is, uh, you know, sounds very good, but the real impact is at this day, this is a December 12, 2006. We launched uh, COSMET data in uh, 2000 during the summertime. And after a few months, we processed the data and uh, ECNW have started using the data. We are very nervous at that time. I don't know what, what, what the output, what the outcome will be. But then immediately when the, in December 12th that the ECNW have started using COSMET data, then you can see this is the, the dash line. The dash line here is uh, uh, is a bias, the, the, the lower part, is a bias relative to the radio song. So their, their measurement before Cosmo and the after Cosmo, you can see immediately that pull this mean bias to closer, be closer to the radio song uh, measurement. It's just one day. And then you think about that, they only have like a 3000 profile. So what really happened there at that time is really that they're using our data as a reference Humble reference to correct whatever uh, data they can correct and then make everything more consistent to the radio song. So people start to realize, wow, only 3,000 profile, then they can do so much. So before that, then actually in the inter uh, correct or, 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 or change whatever differences. But when you have a reference on the orbit, then this is what you have. So people start to pay more attention to our data. And then our data that in, in my team that we already demonstrate a lot of different things using our data for weather and for um, the on orbit calibration. I'm going to talk about some of it and I'm going to talk about the climate monitoring. And uh, this is a chart to talk about the uh, RO processing algorithm, in this case for customer two in stock right now. So there's a several different levels. So we need to read the uh, roll out data and, uh, um, and then tr try to uh, understand the, uh, the, the accuracy of the role measurement and then derive the SS phase, the, the, uh, the, uh, do the POD uh, processing and uh, generate the SS phase and then to you know, derive the uh, level two data.
So we, we do this not only for customer two, but also for uh, commercial data and whatever customer and whatever data that uh, we are we are processing. And uh, so this is the paper we published the previous year to summarize that uh, how and uh, uh, the validation result that we, um, we 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 did for customer two, and then also summarize our processing algorithm. So I probably just leave it here that if you are interesting, you can you know take a look. But that's for the our processing and. Uh, to double, to check the, the data quality, then we do a lot of different things. For example, we compare with the current customer two process result, which is launched in uh, in in uh, just just two years ago, and then compare with a long time process, uh, long term launch, long time launch customer, which is launched in two thousand six, and then match each other. In this case, it's in uh, match the data from two thousand nineteen October, and then see if the data. Have the stability, even though even though one is a launch long time ago. So on the left is a customer two compared with customer. You can see the mean bias. There's a bending angle differences in a fractional sense. The mean mean differences is very consistent to each other. And on the right is a customer two minus uh, concept five when they are correlated to each other. And uh, uh, concept five is a launch much 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 long long time ago. So you can see because the original measurement is a time delay. So what we can measure because of the time is every time is actually care is, is can be traced to the uh, ground the atomic clock. So everything is in very high precision and the very highest stability. And this is also checking for customer two when two receiver are, are very close to each other and then they are viewing the same same uh, uh, same uh, GNSS emitter. So this is to double check the so-called precision when these two are very close to each other, they are viewing the same atmosphere, then how the uh, retrieval will be, which is actually will tell you this, uh, the quality of the uh, receiver itself. So on the left, you can see this is in a, a reflectivity center is a temperature and on the right is in um, um, the water vapor, water vapor emission ratio. And you can see the mean bias itself is very, very close to each other. If we, on the, on the top, you can see the standard deviation and the, on the lower part is uh, I zoom in the scale. And then you can see the positive and negative of the mean bias is within like a minus 0 0.2 Kelvin or minus 0.2% in reflectivity to 2, uh, to 0, to 0, 0, 0.2%. Percent and then if you see the temperature is like a 0.2 Kelvin to like a 0.2 or to minus 0.2 Kelvin to uh, 0.2 Kelvin. So this kind of a precision is very uh, good for climate monitoring. And this is the comparison to. Uh, I think if you have a question that maybe maybe you can ask later when I finish. I will plan for finish everything in uh, probably within. Uh, like 15 minutes total. So you will have uh, probably 10 minutes to asking questions. And this is uh, try to see how consistent is the temperature retrieval from, in this case, is customer two compared to one of the best radios on temperature. In this case, is IS41. And uh, so you can see when we collocate these two together that the mean biases can be as small as a minus 0 0.2 Kelvin. This is from eight kilometer to 30 kilometer and the standard deviation is 1.77. And then on the right is so compared to IS 40, IS 92. And then I have another paper to talk about. They actually have a, the small uh, temperature bias because the uh, radiative correction are not exactly the same for IS 92 and IS 41. So on the middle part, like a 220 kilometer part, you can see there's a, a small differences to like 0.1 Kelvin temperature bias um, between, between IS 92 and IS 41. Which actually you can see that uh, our data are very good to identify this kind of bias and then can kind of, although this IS 92 and IS 41 are not correlated to each other, but they can kind of uh, identify this bias among this, uh, uh, between, between these two data types. And uh, so people want to also know how is the weather impact. So this is a little bit old result, which is published in uh, probably uh, 2011 from ECNWF, but this is actually tell you that what the data type actually can reduce the forecast error. So 
the mainly, I think the best of the data can reduce the forecast error is uh, MSU A, but there's many, many types of MSU, right? Many, many MSU data there. And then the second one probably is uh, IRC, and then inf uh, the AIRS data. And then the third one, or maybe the number four, number four is the AIRS, the, the, um, the aircraft, aircraft uh, temperature um, in situ measurement. And then GPS RO is, uh, is probably very close to number four, which is uh, like the uh, airs, uh, the, the aircraft uh, temperature measurement. So it's, it's a very good, although our data is not as many as others, but our contribution to uh, reducing forecast error is, is on that range, it's, which is it's a pretty amazing consider, consider the, uh, the, the number of the sample itself. Okay, and then for climate application. So for climate, uh, we really want to know how our data can tell us the temp temperature trend just using our data. But we also want to know, can our data be used as a calibration reference to calibrate, for example, the MSU, like the NOAA 14, NOAA 15, which have actually the uh, local time drift, and uh, uh, to generate a long-term climate data record, at least at those times that when, when we have our data. So I did a lot of different research and uh, this is some of the results. And then, by the way, I just using the um, temperature profile from RO and then to using the forward uh, model to, to simulate to the uh, MSU channel 9, 10, and 8 and uh, collocate to each other and then I generate the result. The main difference is actually when you using satellite data, when you collocate to each other, when they are overlapping, in this case, it's this chart then you can see they have different type of uh, different bias. And then you really don't know where the bias coming from. Is that from, for example, like uh, in this case, if you see the upper part, you can see like a NOAA 7 overlap with NOAA 6 or, or others like uh, NOAA uh, 14 minus RO and uh, NOAA 14 to 12 and uh, 15 to 14 and the 16 to 15. I mean, this is all kind of bias. And then some bias have this obviously the maybe location dependent or seasonal variation. So which one should we use as a reference? And then there's just also have gap. And then I published several papers to discuss that this is mainly due to the, the instrument calibration error from that instrument itself. Because when you are on orbit longer time, then the sensitivity for the photon hit the hit the hit the receiver will decaying. Okay, also this is uh, like a solar zenith angle depending bias and local time drift bias all combined together, then you can have this. And then you want to use this to generate long-term climate record. How do you do that? So different uh, team actually try to do this. So without going into too much detail that there's a full team, right? UAH, they have their own way to you know, do the calibration and then give you the so-called climate data trend, which is in monthly climatology in one grid uh, maybe 10 by 10 and then in whole months of me and then do that for multiple years they they do whatever they want to adjust uh, the data higher lower whatever reference correction of the uh, daytime nighttime or whatever and is do their uh, own and then in the third panel is uh, my RO simulated MSU data so that's basically is our data and then simulate using a, a MSU4 model ch for channel 9 and on the right is uh, actually is uh, Changi Zhou's uh, so-called uh, SNO, the simultaneous native viewing overlapping method. So there's a four all together. And then when we compare to each other, you can see on the upper left channel uh, 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 panel that RO ends compared with SNO. You can see and one's over land, one's over uh, ocean is a relative consistent. However, if you compare it, for example, like uh, um, RO MSU with UAH, you can see this, this is uh, look very strange. You cannot tell even it's land or ocean because land buyers and ocean buyers, this is not even in the same planet or something. This is look very strange. And then also on the uh, lower part, you can see SNO, which is from Chenji Zhou's result to compare with UAH, also show this. And then, you know, so from this, you can see how different people actually merge or do their own calibration or the long-term, like uh, um, the sensor-to-sensor -sensor merge method actually will give you the different result. And uh, so in order to do that, I try to using our data as a reference 
and then compare with a different uh, MSU data. In this case, it's channel nine. So NOAA 15 on the left and NOAA 16 and NOAA 18. So you can see the slope and offset are not, not exactly the same. So that means I can actually using RO as a reference and the carry of so care using the slope and offset and the carry each month of NOAA 15 MSU data to RO. So everything is, you know, carry to RO, no matter whatever, you know, reason that you are biased. So I have a reference on the, on the orbit, so I can do this. And after I'm doing this, I also need to identify, this is so-called uh, the solar zeno, solar zeno angle dependent bias, because no matter at the, what location and what time, because the microwave data, when the sun actually heating up the component of the satellite itself, <coughs> it will actually leaking the sun microwave uh, um, energy to the, to the sensor itself. So they may have the so-called solar zeno angle uh, effect, effect microwave bias weaving, weaving each sensor. And then different sensors have different local time orbit, right? So if I generate this uh, with the local time, and uh, you can see the MSU minus cosmic uh, bias, which is in uh, the green one, uh, I mean, the, the orange one. So you can see the latitude dependent bias. And then also, I also calculate this, uh, uh, Calculate the mean solar zeno, so mean solar zeno angle dependent bias is on the uh, blue blue dot. So, and on the on the right, you can see is uh, the solar zeno angle. So you can see the different solar zeno angle actually give the give you the different different bias actually, which is actually introduced by this uh, um, the the local time drift and also the sun shining and how long it shine on the on the on the satellite itself. And after the calibration, so you can see from upper um, upper inter-satellite bias, then, you know, I can kind of consistent carry everything all together and then generate the, the trend itself. Okay, so I, maybe I just skip this. But, but also during the process, then we also want to make sure our processing is, is not affected by the process result. That means a different way to process. Actually, we are not introducing the big differences. So we do many type of uh, experiment in our own processing. Here, I just want to tell you on the, uh, the panel C is we using the same retrieval algorithm, which is in ROPP in this case. And then we input the different assets phase. One is from Yuka and one is from, from STAR. So we process all, our own assets phase and then put that into, in this case, it's ROPP. And I want to see if this two two assets phase can give you the similar bending angle result. So you can see in general, no matter UCAS assets phase or our assets phase, which is actually you need to go through a lot of different uh, time correction and the position correction and a lot of different uh, processing to you know, make sure the assets is the best. But, but even though there's two different processing approach that you have a different assets phase, that when you go into or put that into the same algorithm, in this case, it's OPP, then your mean bias is, is very close to each other and the standard deviation is within a reasonable range, okay? So we do this so-called structural uncertainty of a bending angle retrieval to make sure that we can quantify all the uncertainty we can have due to the, due to the uh, uh, retrieval. So I think, again, when you do the climate research, it's, it's important you, you make sure the, uh, the mean, the, the trend is, is correct. So you, 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 you do so many different things to make sure the trend is reasonable to whatever reference you can understand. But another thing is uh, you need to also understand the uncertainty of the trend itself too. So when you're using a multiple uh, retrieval algorithm to process the same data, then you can kind of understand the so-called structural uncertainty introduced by different implementation of the retrieval algorithm or something. Okay, so then, however, if you want to using our data itself to generate a consistent climate data record, and it still is not as easy as, as we think, the reason is the different our mission actually cover different local time and also different location. So for example, in this case, it's the geoptics, one of the uh, commercial data that you can see it's only cover like uh, uh, 12 and 24 local time. 
and the Spire, that's another um, uh, another company and uh, another commercial weather uh, data, they have a 20 something receiver and they cover four different local time. And then Cosmet 2 from mainly cover from 45 north to 45 south. And uh, um, mainly they they kind of focus their observation around maybe 50 north to 50 south. And uh, but they cover most of the local time. And then you can, okay. So in order to do this, you need to, you need to, and, and then not to mention, not to mention in different time, the, for example, as I showed that before, that uh, customer in the beginning, we have like a 3000 profile per day. And then the, later and later that uh, we, we lose some of this receiver and we have like a 2000 and then 1000 and 500. And, you know, I mean, you, you, you have only that much of the sample and then different coverage, local time, then how do you, how do you make sure you will remove the sampling error, sampling related error, and then generate consistent uh, result? And I have a, you know, several paper on those and uh, I using the uh, different model, different, uh, different real analysis, actually three different real analysis to identify this sampling error and then removing. And then the result is, is like this without going into too much detail. And uh, I'm using, in this case, is generally the monthly climatology, the latitude mean, and uh, using the reprocess of the Cosmo and the main top AB, and then give you this uh, temperature, temperature monthly climatology. In this case, this is the, lat the latitude of the uh, mean. So on the left is a temperature, mean temperature. That I calculate on the center is the coverage, which is the sample using into this, <clears throat> To generate the climatology, and the, on the right is a so-called estimate is the uncertainty for sampling error. Okay, so I just just play it. Okay, so you can see this is from two thousand six to much later. So you can see the coverage. The coverage actually changed, right? And the sampling error in general, sampling error removing or the sampling error estimate in general are. are Better over probably probably sixty north to sixty south, and uh, oops, let me go back. And also, be, uh, also over poorer region that we will have a bigger sampling error, which means you can quantify the data in not only the monthly mean, but also the uncertainty of the monthly mean at that grid. So this is this is uh, very very interesting. But also you can see on the dry temperature itself is relatively smooth. So that means even after we remove the sample error that we still give the reasonable um, time series. Then next one is uh, probably in 2019 or even uh, earlier, we start to think about we should contribute to the IPCC report. And uh, in IPCC report, although that our data only available from probably, I would say, um, reasonable coverage from uh, 2002 to later. Or, uh, the, the, or more data is from 20, uh, 2006 to probably currently. Then we can still using our data and then to generate climatology for multi using multiple our mission and then compare with, in this case, is a uh, MSU generated. So the low panel actually is the one we, you know, using Again, star, which is uh, changing those uh, data data record, and then compare with RSS four version four and uh, UH. edge. So you can see the trend itself from the three data set seems reasonable close to each other. Their trend is about like a minus uh, minus point two five Kelvin per decade. Okay, so that means at the uh, this is the uh, MSU channel four, which is at the lower stratosphere which is actually give you the, if the global warming, the fingerprint over the, uh, like the lower stratosphere is uh, the temperature trend should be decreasing, okay? However, over this uh, low, the, the, the other part from maybe uh, 2002 or 2000, you can see the, the, the temperature trend is a little bit flat. So is that because the global warming stop or slow down or something? So we zoom in for that part and then generate another panel at the a higher, higher panel from 2002 to 2000, in this case, it's 19. And then plot the star RSS and the UH line there, but also on top of it, we're using one of the our center, in this case, is Rome, Rome set, which is from uh, Denmark, 
Denmark Meteorology Institute, and then generate this uh, 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 generate this trend and the, and the time series of the anomaly. So you can see they are also close to each other. However, you can see the the data from RO is the the trend itself is a minus zero is minus zero point six, which is a little bit smaller than others. Okay, then we go look closer. And by the way, this is already be uh, including in this IPCC AR6. And uh, we look closer that we using multiple R center and then try to uh, try to generate this a time series from 2002 to 2018. And then to see if there any uncertainty there. So on the left is a global, which is from 70 nodes to 70 south. On the right is a tropical region. So you can see over, you know, above like uh, maybe uh, 15, or 20 kilometers, we have the negative trend. And then below 15 kilometers, we have uh, some positive trend over the uh, global from 70 north to 70 south and uh, over tropical too. The, the trend itself have a bigger bias, but uh, that's another issue that we are discussing, dis discussing and also try to improve it. Okay, and uh, I need to move on that uh, we also using our data to see if we can identify some radio sound bias, okay? And this is, uh, this is uh, uh, some research I did a while ago that I compare with a different radio sound type. And uh, uh, the, the radio sound actually have a different type, actually is distributed at different locations. For example, for China, they're also only using a China radio sound. And the, the famous uh, radio song is uh, using by many people is RS92 or RS90, which is distributed almost glo globally. And uh, uh, in many in uh, USA, they have only different type of radio song. If we use O as a reference, you can see this is during the daytime. You can see the different radio song type actually have a different bias. The the from negative bias is minus one to one point zero. So we can see some radio song have a different type of bias and uh, can be as big as, especially if you see uh, radio sound over Russia, it can be big as a uh, 1.0 Kelvin. And so I did this, try to identify this is solar zen angle dependent bias for each type of radio sound at the, the height, okay? So this is for this B2 and you can see that during the daytime, you can have a obviously positive bias and during nighttime have a obviously negative bias and for uh, bias a lot, uh, RS92, the uh, no have no obvious data and nighttime bias, and uh, uh, this is MRZ from uh, Russia still also have the daytime bias and the nighttime bias. However, the magnitude is not as as big as the previous uh, uh, previous RSB2, and you can see Shanghai radio song also have their own bias. And after we this is if you want to generate the climate trend. You know, people just choosing whatever radio song type and then to generate this trend. But 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 those trends itself will have obviously bias. So if we're using R as a reference, you can see the obviously daytime, nighttime, or uh, seasonal type of bias. And the, the red is the uh, red is for the daytime, and the, the blue one is for nighttime. You can see the bias itself have a obviously seasonal variation for different uh, radio song type. And uh, uh, on the right, uh, especially for this B2. And then after the correction, I'm using the uh, table I generated to correct the result that most of the radios have the more relative consistent uh, trend itself, which is actually is, is our old trend for that type. So that means we can use our data to correct those uh, radios on type of uh, uh, bias. So I need to go faster, which is go to that what happened. What, what, what is atmosphere uh, application we can use in GPS RO? Consider that RO data penetrate cloud, not affected by cloud and precipitating, precipitation. And uh, also because of the high vertical resolution, we are actually very good to detect the boundary layer height or even the uh, tropical cycle height or even the, uh, the, the trouble pulse variation, which is very useful for a lot of atmosphere study and also for climate study. So this is some result that I did a while ago that over certain region, we have a dominated stratus cumulus cloud. And those clouds are very difficult for infrared microwave and other sensor to detect because it's very low and very persistent. 
<coughs> also, <coughs> they have a sharp boundary layer. But not only that, but also above that, because of the substance of the atmosphere that make that region very dry. So you you probably have not enough thermal contrast to sense that, for example, temperature and water vapor, maybe especially for water vapor above that cloud. So how our data can help? Okay, so I focus on this this uh, small region on the uh, on the uh, on the on the left in south south uh, South American and the east uh, east south of the Pacific Ocean. So this is uh, some some um, study we did recently. Try to see if a Cosmos two actually can help us to identify the boundary height. But we also in the same time collocated with the um, the crypto, the lidar data. So on the left is the lidar data cloud height and the cloud bottom height, and on the uh, right is the crypto data. Uh, prof, uh, I mean the uh, RO data, but RO bending angle. And then we're using the uh, maximum, the minimum gradients method to detect the sharp change level. So you can see that we actually, the, uh, there are three lines. One is the crypto, which is in uh, blue, and the RO data using the maximum likelihood is in black. And so you, you can see these two are very close to each other. And uh, so I, I did that, you know, just as uh, uh, using Cosmet data, and then we can, you know, repeat this. And uh, to demonstrate that um, when they are collocated to each other, then you can see the low cloud height or boundary height detected by Crypto can be also detected by uh, Cosmet or RO data or Cosmet 2, two. Okay, so this is the over that region. I do that um, like a longer time series. In this case, it's from 2007 September. Then you can see the uh, the the seasonal variation over that region can be clearly identified by using a Cosmet data or multiple R data, which is kind of consistent with the uh, light, LIDAR data too. So this is also a case that I using the R data to detect and also collocate it with the Kipso and then to detect the, uh, the tropical cyclone height, okay? So I published the result in the uh, ACP, in, uh, JGR and uh, so you can more. I think I also want to mention, I have uh, five more minutes. I, I, I think I also want to say that our data is also very, very good to detecting the old sky water vapor profile. And uh, in order to do that, I and my team uh, spend a lot of time trying to see how good is our water vapor retrieval result. So in this case, is uh, we compare with the ground-based GPS when they are correlated to each other and the, the penetration high and the, the uh, the ground-based GPS um, sensor high are very close to each other. So you can see the on the left is the uh, Cosmet total water vapor column and also the ground-based GPS. The scattering plot is very consistent to each other. The correlation coefficient is like 0.97. The mean bias is you know very small. And uh, we want to also see that if we can see the seasonal variation at the location of certain ground based GPS. So you can see, you know, the Cosmet total water vapor current. You know, we, we, we uh, calculate the total water vapor current and then collocate with the ground based GPS at the specific location. You can see that follow each other very, very well. You can see the seasonal variation. You can see the specific higher uh, value at a certain year that actually detected by ground based GPS can also detect by um, um, Cosmet too. But also in the same time, we can also using the our data because our data can also see through the cloud and that were not affected by you know precipitation and others. So this is the study we using Cosmet two total water vapor column, but but correlated with uh, the microwave imager. And the microwave imager, we always assume that their their uh, data quality will be the same. There's no specific bias when this is a cloudy or precipitating or raining. But when we compare each other, collocate the uh, clothes collocate to each other and uh, uh, but separate with clear, cloudy is in the center panel, but with no precipitation. And then on the right is the precipitating. And you can see that on the left, we have like a mean bias is 0.9. 
And on the center that you can see the mean bias is become 2.49. And when it's a precipitating, it's a 3.7. So we can kind of identify the precipitating um, condition that do affect maybe is the incomplete incompletely of the, um, the, the full scattering effect from the microwave imaging. So we you know that the many different other study by using this. So I think this is the last one I want to show that um, uh, this is just a finished like uh, three days ago. We're using our data, the all the our mission, and then generate the total water vapor current, and then to generate the long term time long time time long term time series, and then in this case it compare with EI five over land and uh, with the uh, RSS using microwave imager, and then generate the long term the uh, climate long 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 term water vapor amount variation which is actually we try to see that in the past years and for the multiple years you know before then how is the climate the global warming trend will actually will affect will affect the uh, total water vapor current detected by our data and the generate or or, or from reanalysis and also in this case is uh, from the microwave imager so over over land, you can see the trend itself and the uh, the total water vapor color anomaly is very consistent among the EI five and uh, between EI five and RO. And over ocean, you can see the the this several line actually line up to each other very well, and then catch the uh, high anomaly, lower anomaly, and uh, recent recent years is very reasonable. And this is some result I showed a long time ago that for the RO data can detect the ENSO. I think my time probably is uh, up. So let me go to my conclusion very fast. So I think the conclusion is, uh, um, again, NOAA has decided using our data be a long-term core observable for, uh, for many different applications, including the weather, climate, and the atmosphere study. And the install, we process the data from the very beginning to the end. We process not only COSMET2, but all available our mission so that we can help to identify uncertainty, quality, and the many other stuff for numerical weather prediction, and then generate the climate data record for the climate and the apply and the generate the uh, data product for all kinds of the atmosphere study that needed by the, um, the scientific community. And uh, if you are interested, I think I write this paper, the Ben's paper, the first one, as you summarize, for the past of probably more than 12 years of the uh, RO application in atmosphere science, in climate, in weather, and many others. And uh, you know, if you are interested, you are very welcome to take a look at that paper. And then also in a star that we actually, uh, again, as I say, that we not only have the RO data processing group, we also do the climate in the comparison and the to multi-sensor in the comparison to make sure the data quality is consistent. We will also do the, uh, the the detail detailed study for understand not only the full model but also all the um, all the reason will give you the uncertainty for different RO mission and the different uh, processing and then we apply that to a data simulation we also run the uh, edge wolf to do the data simulation impact with and uh, without RO and uh, if you are interesting then this is my email and also my group uh, link is you know in the in the bottom. And I believe that we can have a good understanding about the RO application and the data quality, and which is should be very useful for many RO or many uh, many uh, NOAA line overs, including OPA, OSAP, or even um, uh, uh, NCEI and uh, other 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 center too. So um, should be also very useful for uh, other climate. Kind of, or and the weather and the also atmosphere community. Okay, I think that's all my talk. I hope that's clear for you and that you are still here. I probably will take a few questions, I guess. Sure, so uh, a great talk. And uh, so any questions? Yeah, just unmute yourself. Or you can also um, message in the chat.
while um, the attendees are still thinking, uh, I think I have the privilege to ask uh, the first question. So, okay. uh, Dr. Ho, in your slides, uh, we saw when you compare the R with the UH, the scanter plus through the answer is a very odd um, discrepancy. So, um, is there, so can you, can you give us um, why um, such a discrepancy is present? Uh, can you guys still see my see my PowerPoint or should I show my PowerPoint? Yes, I can see your PowerPoint. Oh, you can see my PowerPoint. Okay. Just try to hmm. say it again. You, you are talking about the ISS compared with your edge, right? Okay, go back. Oh, this. Right. Yeah, yes. right. So yeah, I think this is a good question. And then all this question actually is uh, related to how different group actually to do their calibration. So there's two parts. So you need to do the calibration and then choosing whatever uh, satellite as a reference and then do your move up, move down. And then this, I think that's a problem because this two center using different way to to uh, to calibrate their daytime, nighttime differences. Okay, so that means a different way to uh, correct their local time drift actually will give you different results. Okay, but but again, that's 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 uh, really really from your edge and from the um, from from the RSS. So, but that's what I understand for now. Okay, but but any question for RO? Anybody has um, any questions? You can unmute yourself. Um, just click the right button on the right button. Or you can um, send me uh, questions. Or any comments or any 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 whatever. Ben, this is Robbie. Oh, Robbie, yeah, yeah. Um, Are you yeah, I do have a question. I'm yeah, I'm really interested in okay. especially the um you know, the microwave time series, uh -huh. but also how RO can really help that, which you've shown. Um mm -hmm. now the fact that each of these missions have a just seem like a different time of day and mm -hmm. geographic distribution. Have you yes. been able to compare and contrast the different missions in separate statistics and see how they compare? Yes, I did. I did. And then you Maybe can I see missed that. Right, right. So the answer is yes. And then you need to do all kinds of different things to make sure that all the so called uh, relative to our bias can be identified. So I think the short answer is yes. That's that's how there's a low part, the time series can be generated, right? Okay, yeah, because yeah, I noticed the summer six o'clock and eighteen, you know, six C yeah. and eighteen Z and summer twelve and twenty-four, and then cosmic goes all over the place and it seems like it'd be easy to easy to oh, it'd be a lot of work to compare, but it's like it would be interesting to see how those are. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can we can talk more later later. That's why that I discussed with you about your your um, your calibration and the uh, uh, validation result too, right? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm I'm, I'm looking for directions. <laughs> no, no, that's. Sure. I think that would be good work. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? I cannot see you. I cannot even know how many people are there. We have. We actually have some uh, six uh, sixty four people. Oh, okay. Actually. Okay. Right now there are still over fifty people. Okay, sure. A any question? A anything? Any comments? So I assume I give a perfect talk. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Hey Ben, this is Ralph. Yeah, very very nice job. I was I didn't really. 
I was waiting for other people to uh, chime in, but yeah, I en enjoyed your talk and it's, it's oh, a really good topic. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, any other questions? Um, all right, while I'm speaking, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, otherwise, we, um, I think we, we would like to thank the speaker for his excellent presentation. And also, I want to thank everyone for coming. And um, our seminar continues next week, um, uh, next Monday. And stay tuned, please. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Dr. Ho. Thank uh, yeah. We'll send you the yeah, you. Um, the link of the of the video recording once we retrieve it. Okay. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.